Welcome to Sermon Brainwave with me, Caroline Lewis. And me, Joy J. Moore. And me, Matt Skinner. The text for the seventh Sunday after Pentecost, which falls on July 24, 2022, are from Genesis chapter 18, 20 through 32. The semi-continuous reading goes now to Hosea, the prophet Hosea, chapter 1, verses 2 through 10. Psalm 138, we continue our reading through Colossians chapter 2, 6 through 15, and then you can add 16 through 19 if your homiletical heart desires, and Luke 11, 1 through 13. All, All right. right, happy so here's the, happy Lord's Prayer Day. Yes. The here's the uh, other memory of uh, the prayer that Jesus taught his disciples. <laughs> yes, yes. Uh, and so that, yeah, it, it's different, obviously, than um, Matthew. Uh, but it, you know, here, the, I mean, uh, that extension, right, or what then Luke follows with uh, is, is important. And that kind of, um, well, I guess, you know, uh, that kind of persistence uh, in prayer. And, but I think the, you know, the, the main thing to recognize first, this, this will just, this will be my first point, is that uh, it starts out, he said to them, when you pray, you know, Lord, teach us to pray as John taught his disciples. He said to them, when you pray, say, Father, hallowed be your name. And then the pericope ends with chapter, or verse 13, how much more will the heavenly father give the Holy spirit to those who ask him? And so that, that bracketing or that framing of all of this, you know, the, about what prayer looks like and sounds like is bracketed by relationship. And I think that's, uh, I think that's why do we pray uh, that recognition of it, that to whom do we pray? We pray because of, that trust and that uh, trust in the father, trust in relationship. And so that that's the first thing that I want to name in this, in this passage. I love that. My, I highlighted verse 13 as well saying, um, you know, what if the focus is, is there the God to whom we pray. And I appreciate you highlighting that it begins by saying that this God is holy. This mm -hmm. God is trustworthy. This God is good. This God is faithful. It's, you know, what is holiness, but all that is trustworthy and good, dependable. And therefore, as you ask these things, know that this God who we can trust is going to do more than we would do because mm -hmm. God is more just, more faithful, more holy than we are. Um, so I love the bracketing. I hadn't paid attention to that until you said that, but I had made that same focus in terms on what if we begin this by focusing on who God is. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and what, how, what God does and, 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 what God and, does. and that trusting in relationship and that, that relationship, that trust then gives the context for that persistence. Why can you persist? Why can you, uh, or, you know, another translation of that term is shamelessness or a lack of propriety <laughs> that you could just kind of keep on asking without any worry about, you know, uh, kind of casting your uh, inhibitions aside. You know, I can't ask for that. I shouldn't ask for that. You know, uh, that, that, you, you're, that persistence is possible because of that relationship. Uh, and even if you extend that outside of our relationship with God, but you think about, you think about uh, relationships that are deep and abiding and trustworthy, those are the relations that you can ask for what you need, right? Uh, that you can have conversations about, uh, 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 about what, you, you know, you trust that person, right, to persist. In, uh, in what is going to make this relationship better or what's going to grow this relationship or 
um, or, or that even your own recognition of how much you trust that person uh, to be able to kind of cast aside, you know, uh, your, that which might uh, inhibit you and you just, that uh, it, there's, so there's a kind of vulnerability here, kind of a, a vulnerability that I find really quite poignant, actually. If to be human is to be, bear the image of God, mm -hmm. then what you just said is exactly what the world should see, at least in those of us who claim to be followers of God, the people of God, is that we are trustworthy, uh, that we do build relationships where we will provide and we can in that same way, shamelessly ask and depend and know that we will receive and be cared for. Uh, I love that in terms of what it means for us to bear the image of God. You have to know this God to be good in order to practice that goodness in our lives. The prayer strikes me about how it's, uh, in light of all this relationality that we've talked about, the prayer also commits us to a number of things that I think are really important that this is not just a prayer that, that tells God who God is or reminds us out loud who God is. So I think it, it, it and so it's worth slowing down and saying a lot of congregations pray this prayer together every single week. You can pray it without even really thinking about it, mm -hmm. but what is it committing us to do? So even that, that opening line, hallowed be your name, or literally let your name be sacred um is partly about us <laughs> it's saying that our actions are going to influence god's reputation mm -hmm. um and we want that to be the case right our actions are going to if we to the extent to which we align ourselves with god's good and holy name right that god's power is known in the world god's essence god's reputation is known in the world and that's that's significant um, there at the outset. And then the same thing with, you know, the, 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 the connection between forgive us our sins as we forgive those who are indebted to us and how that, and how that, how that works, how that commits us to something. Um, it's a present tense verb, uh, here in Luke that our own, um, that our own forgiving of others, uh, but there's also an aorist imperative there that, that expects that God will definitively forgive us. See what I mean? The forgive us our sins is that's the imperative that's, you know, do it uh, as we continue to, or as we don't cease in forgiving the indebtedness that others mm -hmm. owe to us. So there's some, there's theology in that, that, that we want to talk about, but it, again, that commits us to an ongoing lifestyle um, of our relationships with one another too. And I think, uh, yeah, and the other thing uh, kind of connected to that, too, is this sort of stance of prayer that is, uh, mm, I don't know, uh, it, there, maybe, maybe mutuality or reciprocity is not the right word, but like a really deep, like a, a promise or a certainty of really, uh, of really deep listening like that sort of trust in God, that God is really, uh, God is able to, to hear what you're asking for. I mean, and what I mean by that is in verse 12, you know, for if the child asks for an egg, we'll give a scorpion, no, ask, egg, we'll give a fish, um, we'll give a snake instead of a fish. You know what I'm talking about. If your child asks for a fish, we'll give you a snake instead of a fish. We were talking about spiders earlier, but you know, you ask for a puppy and you get a spider. Uh, so uh, but there's something in that too, like that that uh, that uh, that promise of listening. Does that make sense? Or that prom the, the, that the relationship with God uh, commits God also to a kind of listening, uh, and maybe even um, uh, maybe even a kind of listening that uh, is able to listen around the edges of what we're trying to say, or what we <laughs> or what we want, or what we need. Uh, that I find really, I find really powerful as well in this prayer. I was just in a conversation with someone, and this happens over and over again. But as you were speaking, it reminded me that um, we ask God for things, and we ask in confidence and faith. We, you know, oh, I will ask God. I will pray about this. I will take this to God. And then when it comes about, you know, when we ask for an egg and we get an egg. 
we're like amazed. Mm-hmm. You, you know, and and on one level, I greatly appreciate that that amazement at us is us not taking for granted that God not only hears, but heeds our prayer. But there's also this sense of why are we so amazed? <laughs> you know? um, and, and it gets back to the character of God, you know, mm-hmm. the character of the one that we are asking, because it, it's um, you know, when I was a kid and I would ask my mom for things, there were times when I know there was no way I was going to get it. And I was asking because I wanted to put my hands on my hips and say how mean my mom was because she wouldn't give me this thing I shouldn't be asking for in the first place. Mm -hmm. Is that how we go to God? Mm -hmm. And I think, again, you you know, I started this out in terms of focusing on on that verse 13, uh, the character of God. And uh, if, if you will, and I have to remember, you said you had two points, and now I've forgotten if you got both of them out, Caroline. Um, but um, if, if we would, I'd go to uh, the Genesis text, because for me, that's exactly what is happening here. Um, um, far be it from you. This is, this is Abraham's language to God, now knowing what is about to happen. And Abraham doesn't take the position of, oh, great, cancel them because I don't like them in the first place. They're not, you know, living the way I think they should be living. No, Abraham appeals to the character of God. And in that appeal, appeals even for those who God is rightly judging. And I, and I say that because I'm trusting the character of God. And, um, too often our preaching over you know the years has used our own agenda to say what it is that is the right judgment but i am increasingly uh, taken by the interpretation of hospitality and lack of hospitality so last week we 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 saw this extension of hospitality uh, by abraham and now um That hospitality is actually um, in contrast to the way Sodom and Gomorrah have have treated others. And God is rightly judging that. And Abraham's response is to say, now, wait a minute, God, let's look at who you are. In your character, how will you respond? And then there's this wake up call of remembering, okay, we are talking about Sodom and Gomorrah. So maybe there won't be as many people. So God, can I renegotiate that? We Can we lower that a bit? And because of the character of God, God hears and heeds this request of Abraham as Abraham appeals, not to the judgment he'd like to see, but to the character of God and how God's testimony will be made based on the actions God is about to take. Mm -hmm. Ellen Davis says that this is where Abraham is a prophet and a priest. Mm -hmm. Like that. All right. I'm going to just put this out here. I have no idea what to do with Hosea. (laughs) Like, this passage is really bothersome to me. Anybody else? Yes, and. Yes. <laughs> yes, and. So, um, you know, uh, we, we, Hosea, Hosea is a seldom noted text. text and um, we, we're now going to have a few readings to be able to explore uh, the Northern Kingdom. We, we actually have about 25 recorded um uh, messages of, of Hosea, um, largely more in a, a, a poetic kind of voice, um, but obviously a difficult word to hear. And uh, so as I'm reading this, or as I'm anticipating our going through um, uh, Hosea, uh, I think that, and this leans into what I was saying uh, about uh, Abraham as well, we're in a, a cancel culture where we're fed up with the failures of the government, we're fed up with the failures of the church, we're fed up with uh, a failing economy, we're fed up with 
our our relationships, our families, our partners, our 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 friends, our neighbors, and and so this book is challenging uh, because it is a call for faithfulness in the face of failure, in the face of unfaithfulness. Um, and, and so if you if you take what I just said about how Abraham is responding uh, to Sodom and Gomorrah and apply it here, it's that s- a similar kind of, we can talk about all that is wrong, but where is our faithfulness in this? Um, God's love, God, God is love, God is loving here. God is faithful here in the face of the prophet exposing the hypocrisy of the people. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and he's not talking about their ancestors. I mean, it, it would be easy to read this text and sort of say that was them then. That's not how this is written. Uh, Hosea isn't talking about the sins of the previous generation, the hypocrisy of their ancestors. He's saying, look how we're doing the same thing. And so this is a rebuke of the people who are believing that military might is safer than God's promised protection. And and as I say that, I know this is what makes this a difficult text. Um, Because when I say God is, I think about the weeks that we've gone before in terms of living in the promise yet fulfilled of God. I don't mean to sound like pie in the sky. But I am meaning to say, what might it mean for pastors to speak to the failures of their congregation, not to the failures of the folks outside, but to the failures of their congregation, and to use that to say, how are we demonstrating the faithfulness of God? Because that's what it means to be human. And, and um, then I just skip to the psalm. You might skip to the song. And that it's might be safer. Right there. It says about be- your steadfast love and your faithfulness. So I like that better than <laughs> Hosea. I, I, uh, and I, yes, I, you know, what you all, what you said, I just, um, yeah. <laughs> so, you know, I've been writing this past couple of months. And as I look at this with the way that I've just looked at, we often use the psalm liturgically. Um, and um, this might be a bit of an or- unorthodox way to do this. But if a pastor is willing to be pastoral in calling out um, the unfaithfulness of the congregation, Um, that's not finger pointing, that's a loving invitation, Um, then reading this psalm might simply be um, uh, a way of saying, here are the right words. Mm. What's the right behavior that follows it? Because that's what the, that's what the, um, that's what each of the prophets that we are reading these weeks are doing. We're going to talk about this when we get to Isaiah, talking about the um, right worship, but unrighteous practices. And, and at some point or another, if we're going to address it, Hosea allows us to do this. And the safest way to do it is to do it with the ancient people in a voice that causes us to recognize we're still there. I'll leave it alone, but. <laughs> I think you put your finger on something that this is what kind of disqualifies Hosea for me, which is the idea of you talk about a pastor speaking it in a pastoral way. And I think Hosea does not. And that's why I, I just would like to give Hosea a time out for three or 400 years um, personally, <laughs> but let me say this. Uh, there's, I could imagine a congregation being invited into a two week study of Hosea that also kind of opens the curtain a little bit and invites a congregation to wrestle with yeah. what makes this book problematic and difficult. So back in 2008, Diane Jacobson, who used to teach at Luther Seminary, wrote a piece for uh, Word and World. There used to be a thing that was like called face to face. It was two people would argue an issue in just like two pages each. And she wrote both sides, one saying that Hosea is, um, is a really helpful, liberating book. And one saying this book is just horrible. The metaphor can't be redeemed. And so she argues with herself and, and you can find this if you just 
Google like Hosea, Diane Jacobson, Word and World. Yeah. Um, but it gets at the issue, which is is the the cruelty of Hosea one and two so much that it just becomes irredeemable because then you get to chapter 11, which we'll look at next week, which is some of the most beautiful language of God's tender care you can you can find in scripture. But are you allowed to read that disconnected from the context, right? Or does Hosea one and two, this is my term, not Diane's, but does it poison mm -hmm. chapter 11 and make chapter 11 appear unreliable and um, or untrustworthy? And we don't have time to get into this, but for me, it does personally, but for others, it does not. And I respect the, the way that the text works, but I do think that we need to invite people into the fact that not just you've got these two passages, one really upset, one really loving, but they sit in the same book. And so how does, and, the, and as well as all the intervening chapters, how does that matter for what we see? And how does the metaphor live outside of the text and outside of the historical situation as well? But. And I'm going to, I said I was going to stop. I'm not. <laughs> um, if what we do is we focus on problematizing Hosea, which I'm very willing to do, I think it does exactly what Hosea is doing, and that is problematizing the people of God. Because I would say there are a lot of us who would prefer to cancel people who disagree with us. That's not what I'm saying I'm doing. I, I, I'm gonna resist the, the suggestion that I'm trying to quote unquote cancel Hosea. Oh, I, I wasn't, oh, oh, I see what you're saying. Well, my issue- uh, well, in, si yeah. Silencing him for another 300 years. And so canceling might be too, too-, too Well, I, I don't, yeah. But I, 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 I actually- have, I think we have different Matt, views on cancel culture as well, Joy. Yeah, I don't in, wanna... in, in, that, in that, Matt, I was actually agreeing with you. So I didn't communicate myself well because canceled culture is such a, a, a loaded term. But I, I was actually agreeing that if we pay attention to does talking out of both sides of his mouth negate the good, asking that of ourselves, do we negate as witnesses to the goodness of God when we are not, when we are being overly judgmental, are we doing the very same thing? My thing is, I, I don't. I don't think I'm as far away from you as as you're feeling. Maybe I don't so. know. Yeah, it's just yeah. I, I do think there's a. I, I think that well, I think a lot of things, but I do think that <laughs> it's a question of finally who is the God that Hosea puts forward, and I don't think I recognize this God from other part in light of other parts of Scripture. But mm -hmm. uh, and I can't get I can't get past the metaphor. It's one of those texts that. Um, it's one we've talked about this before, but it's one of those texts that if you read out loud, you have to preach it. And so um, because because whoredom is just a, a really, really loaded term for women. And I have a, an extraordinarily difficult time with it. No, I don't even I, and at the end of the day, I don't care what Tose is doing with it. <laughs> I just like that just is a word that is really, really bothersome to me. And the idea that is really bothersome. And so that, you know, that the redemption of the metaphor, I don't know if I can, I can go there, but that's not the only one in scripture. That's for sure. That's for sure. Yeah. Cause my, my brain is just going all over the place with that, but yeah. You know, so yeah. Uh, do well, we want here's the thing. Some congregations can handle this. So don't try to protect yourselves from the, from the controversy or from the, the struggle that we're illustrating here i mean some congregations probably don't need to go there this week and right they, but uh but some do and they need to get a they're ready to talk about these things people are people's faith is a little more rugged than we sometimes give them credit for right mm -hmm. yeah and to have a disagreement you can disagree with yourself in the pulpit yeah Preach two different yeah. sermons from two different parts of the sanctuary you know and, and show people the dialogue if you want i love it i love it i love it good do we want to do anything on 138 besides the fact that that's what I would skip to? <laughs> well, uh, and we already, we already, I already said, you know, yeah, brought us back to the trouble with Hosea. <laughs> okay. Colossians 
two, six through 15, 16 through 19. All right, I'm gonna I'm gonna start off on this because I know we're loving uh, uh, Colossians, and I've already gotten in trouble this week, so I'm just gonna stay say that this is a hard text. In, trouble. in 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 our our. <laughs> well, if if for some for some preachers who might choose to preach this, it could be troublesome, uh, and this meaning Hosea, which I, I think is the proper warning that you guys are, are, are pushing uh, to balance out my encouragement to say, well, maybe you should. Um, so just staying in that to say that um, in our neoliberal, radically political, post-theistic, post-modern context, I think that this Colossians is again um, um, a difficult text. And I don't I don't know that we say this enough on the podcast. And so I wanted to just say with our whole discussion on Isaiah, um, but like Abraham, who's having a conversation with God, Abraham's praying for these people when God is about to make, rain down judgment. Like that, before you preach whatever you preach any week, are you focused on God and hearing from God's word? And I, I don't know if we say that enough. And in light of the tensions of both the Hosea text and what could be in Colossians, I think it's real important for us uh, to recognize that this, um, if we speak this like a letter to this ancient community, that we speak it um, um, with appreciation for um, the faithfulness of God and unfaithful people for whom God's promises are not going to be denied. And I love um, Schellenberg's commentary and would, would draw people to that. But the word I wanna say this week is, is to make sure you're prayed up no matter what you're praying, pre preaching. And again, with this text to, to invite people into this, this intersection of theological realities and practical living and and the pursuit of spirituality. And I don't think the Colossians is um, is against people feeding their spiritual lives, but it always wants to keep this focus on Jesus. This book is so relentlessly Christocentric and talks about Jesus woven into the fabric of all things and into one's very own self, that the whole fullness of deity dwells bodily in him. And this is again, one of the books that talks about us as, as Christ's own body that that's um that that's us right to participate in the entire fullness of deity that's just kind of cool um and as well this deity isn't just passive but is one that might disarm rulers and authorities right that overcomes um these powers in the world and to invite people into imagining how we ourselves embody that powerful message <laughs>